doctor very happy to welcome you to this neuroendoscopic society india monthly webinar series 3 we have had excellent response from all of you doctor, from the series 1 and 2 very happy to welcome you to this neuroendoscopic society india monthly webinar series 3 we have had excellent response from all of you doctor, from the series 1 and 2 there is an echo echo there is a echo there is a echo santosh can you please take care of this yes 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 there is an echo echo there is a echo there is a echo santosh can you please take care of this yes 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 hello sir please go ahead sir yeah thank you this webinar comes through you to through a digital initiative by help and you a joint venture with new link company limited japan our mission is to fulfill unmet medical needs by launching innovative first time in india products for example amnurite amitriptylin plus mecobalamin combination we launched for the first time in india we have amnurite 5 10 and 25 for neuropathic pain and for migraine pain relief feeling good we were the first one to combine amitriptylin plus propranolol for uh, migraine which is not controlled by one drug amnurite beta 520 er and 1040 er uh, the first pharmacological combination for moderate to severe neuropathic pain uh, amnurite p amitriptyline plus pregabalin in sustained release form to match pharmacokinetics of amitriptyline it is pharmacological we have a mycobalamin injection imported from japan incidentally we have two japan japanese speakers today a uh, new right injection comes to you from japan the one and only made in japan for low back pain and for neuropathic pain we were the first one to launch 2.5 mg strength of clobazam uh, to add flexibility and control to your treatment of epilepsy 2.5 5 and 10 we have recently launched a new concept vitamin therapy for migraine uh, as recommended by american academy of neurology and american headache society riboflavin 200 mg magnesium 200 mg and coq10 10 mg brentamin you can add into your conventional therapy of migraine you can give it to growing children where academics are important and uh, to a pregnant lady having migraine where there is no other choice today's webinar and all other earlier webinars which are conducted by us are available on our A channel on youtube known as dg neuro now more than 40 plus webinars are available there it is developing into a good resource for neurosurgeons and uh, neurologists so please visit this channel like it and uh, subscribe to it today's webinar also will be available tomorrow on this channel in case you miss any of the uh, part so today i have a great pleasure this particular uh, webinar series has been conceptualized by uh, dr suresh sangla sir uh, sir is a consultant neurosurgeon from mumbai india sir has been uh, sir is president current president of neuroendoscopic society of india uh, past president of indian society of pediatric neurosurgery sir has been past president also for indian society of neuro oncology past president of skull based surgery society of india uh, sir is a founder editor of uh, journal of neurosciences uh, publication also past president of bombay neurosciences of uh, uh, neurosciences uh, society in mumbai sir has uh, uh, written 123 papers in peer reviewed journals uh, have published 24 uh, in uh, journal 24 articles in books and uh, he has edited two textbooks of uh, neurosurgery so great pleasure uh, to welcome dr suresh sankla sir and uh, to carry his uh, webinar series uh, we have another great luminary of endoscopic neurosurgery in india uh, dr professor yr yadav to coordinate this series uh, we have been fortunate to carry his own webinar series uh, a series set of uh, eight uh, uh, webinars uh, sir is director super specialty hospital professor and hod of uh, nscb government medical college uh, jabalpur Uh, sir has performed 51 live 
uh, endoscopic surgery and cadaveric workshop. Uh, sir has organized 20 prestigious endoscopic fellowship uh, in his career. Expert referee in 37 international and national journals. Recipient of a prestigious Charak Award. Visiting professor in prestigious institute AM Ames, Delhi. Published uh, 131 peer-reviewed articles, 35 chapters in textbooks, 209 papers. Very elaborate uh, research work. Uh, editor of neuroendoscopic book, co-editor of Neurology India Journal. More than 79 publications in neuroendoscopy. Uh, he has devised a new minimally invasive tubular brain retractor, very economical for uh, 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 smaller uh, cities and districts for our uh, Indian uh, cities. Uh, new surgical technique to avoid blind areas. So very happy to introduce to you Dr. Professor Vajar Yadav, who do not require introduction in neurosurgery in India. So now I hand over the session to Dr. Suresh Sankla, sir, please carry it over. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sankla, sir. Dr. Suresh Sankla. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I. Sir. Uh, Please take it over, sir. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Naik, for introducing the uh, uh, panelists and the moderators. Uh, uh, we would like to thank you for organizing this uh, webinar for the Neuroendoscopy Society of India successfully for this is the third consecutive meeting and you really require a, a great hand. Our pleasure. Uh, this is the third uh, webinar in the series, uh, and we have chosen the very common topic, and uh, I'm sure uh, the audience would uh, appreciate the, the speakers. Uh, the speakers are excellent uh, in their fields, and uh, we have good moderators uh, uh, in Dr. Vyar Yadav. He will really conduct the entire uh, 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 some, some problem with the mice or there is uh, still echoing going. Uh, can you? Yeah. Echo again. There's yeah. echo. Yeah, Mr. Naik, can you? You're muted, Suresh. Doctor, Doctor, muted. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah, Mr. Naik, can you? This is some eco coming actually. Uh, Mr. Everybody Santosh, else muted. Is... Mr. Santosh, can you help? Uh, Yadav, sir, in your laptop, some other video is going on. Uh, Mr. Santosh, some Mr. problem Santosh, with me, my laptop. Okay. Yes, sir, in your laptop, I think another one video is playing. Is that eco is coming. Okay, okay. So uh, can you mute it for? Uh, yeah, he has uh, muted it, sir. You can carry on. Sir. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. So I would like to welcome all the uh, speakers uh, and uh, the audience, the participants who have really spared time for this webinar in this Sunday afternoon and uh, try to be with us uh, for the entire webinar. Uh, I would uh, thank uh, the moderator, uh, Dr. Uh, Vyar Yadav, who has really, you know, be kind enough to be here with us today and uh, agreed to moderate this session for us. Now I would uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Pathak to come and address the uh, audience and uh, uh, start proceeding with the first speaker. Dr. Pathak, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, again, I thank the president of the society uh, to have the initiative to start uh, this webinar series. And uh, uh, it is his idea, and I have just been a helping hand in the situation to take the series, and we are going to conduct series of webinars. Now today, uh, before I go on to the first speaker, it is my pleasant duty to introduce uh, the two uh, great panelists today, with whom uh, who have sort of kindly agreed to be part of this webinar and uh, uh, be an expert uh, sort of person. Uh, first of all, it's my pleasant duty to introduce uh, Dr. Sarat Chandra, who is, you know, is Professor of Neurosurgery at All India Institute of Medical Sciences and also head of the unit there. He probably needs no introduction, but it just is a formal duty for me to do that. 
He is a team leader for Center of Excellence for Difficult to Treat Epilepsy and, and uh, Magnetoencephalography Brain Mapping Center. He is a fellow of UCLA Los Angeles Facility 1000 International League Against Epilepsy. He was a Penry Fellow, Wake Forest University, North Carolina. He was his he's a past president of the Asian Epilepsy Surgery Society, past secretary and president Skull Base Society of India, and he is a secretary of the Cervos, he was a secretary of the Cervoscular Society. His academic profile is huge. Just to make it very short, he has got 310 publications, total number of awards and grants are 12. His lectures uh, presented in various conferences mount to almost 200, 192. He has uh, sort of patents awarded about three and his surgical experience is more than 20,000. And it can go on, uh, but with this, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Sharad Chandra to this webinar. The most important thing, he is unique in the world to uh, perform endoscopic procedure for corpus callosotomy in epilepsy, which is unique and has been really well appreciated all over the world. The other uh, panelist, nonetheless, then Dr. Uh, Bhagat Singh, who is an alumnus of uh, Madurai Medical College. Uh, he did his uh, training from there, his MS and his neurosurgical training from there. He has been very much uh, interested into the field of neuroendoscopy in adults and pediatrics for which he specialized and got training from UPMC Pittsburgh. And uh, we know uh, he conducted uh, the endo, neuroendocon uh, extremely well in 2019 at Madurai. And he has got uh, quite a few number of publications in the Journal of Neuroendoscopy and in few peer reviewed journals. With this, I uh, welcome both the panelists and it's a great honor to have you both. I think Professor Yadav has been already referred to, so he doesn't need any special introduction. Everybody knows him and most of the things have been covered, uh, but only I would just like to add Professor Yadav who is organizing this conference has got so many innovative uh, activities to his credit uh, related to neuroendoscopy. He has modified brain retractor for deep seated lesions. He has described new modified techniques of water jet dissection in endoscopic third ventriculostomy he has described the term complex hydrocephalus and he has number of modifications to go into the blind areas in the brain with endoscope. And of course, his great achievement and it's a pioneering work for him that he has now uh, uh, trained a uh, uh, huge number of uh, uh, trainees, uh, 620 and fellows of which there are 577 Indian fellows and 43 foreign fellows. So it's, it's a real achievement and it's an honor for the country to have a pioneering person like him with us. With this, I, uh, with the permission of the chair, I now have the pleasure to invite nobody else, none other than Professor Fuminari Kamatsu, who is MD, PhD, uh, and he's, he did his MD from Tokai University, Japan in 1998. Then he did his PhD in 2005 from the Fukuoka University Graduate School, Japan. He was assistant professor there. And then in 2009, he went for research fellowship to the Department of Neurosurgery, University Delgi, studied in Nepali, Nepali in Nepal's Italy. In 2009 to 2011, he was research fellow in the Center for Anatomy and Cell Biology in the Medical University of Vienna in Austria. He was assistant professor in the department of Tokai University. Then he was associate professor in the department of neurosurgery at Tokai University in Japan. Now he also joined the department of neurosurgery in the Institute of Neurosciences, Kolkata. And uh, if you see his uh, procedures specifically going deep into the brain, the, it's really mesmerizing. He has got great academic interest in neuroendoscopic anatomy and neuroendoscopic keyhole surgery and endoscopic endonasal skull based surgeries. With these few words, I take the honor to invite Professor Fuminari Kamatsu to start his talk. Professor Kam uh, Kamatsu, please. 
can hear can hear me hello can you hear me yes yes we can hear you oh. okay thank you thank you chairman uh, and also thank you thank you for giving this opportunity to me Please share your screen. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay. We can. Let's... Yes, we can see. Okay, let's start. So, uh, so my topic today is the endoscopic management of ICH and IBH case selection and technique. So after the advent of the endoscopy. Uh, Endoscope has facilitated the minimally invasive neurosurgery, and the endos endoscopic evacuation of hematoma is one of the major procedures in endoscopic neurosurgery. Today, I talk about the overview of the endoscopic evacuation of the hematoma. First, I talk about the surgical indication. The, we Japanese. We have the, the Japanese guideline for the management of the stroke. And it was issued by the Japanese Stroke Society and uh, based on the surgical result of the international articles. I just followed the surgical indication of the guideline. The, I introduced uh, some of the indication from the guideline. I think this is the almost same as the indication of the India. The, for example, the terminal hemorrhage, the surgical, uh, surgical indication is uh, more than 30 uh, ml or the E2 or E3 cases. And uh, in cases of the thalamic hemorrhage, the thalamic hematoma itself is not surgical indication, but the uh, complication of the IBH and the hydrocephalus become the surgical indication. For cerebral hemorrhage, the more than three centimeter or uh, the complication of the hydrocephalus is also the surgical indication. And the robot hemorrhage, the detailed recommendation was not mentioned in the guideline, but uh, the, it says that uh, depend on the cases, it becomes the surgical indication. In contrast, pontine hemorrhage is not regarded as the surgical indication. I think that these are almost same uh, surgical indication in India. And also this Japanese guideline uh, mentioned the endoscopic surgery. The endoscopic surgery it can be performed the uh, same uh, guideline under the same guideline of the conventional surgery. But uh, it's interesting that the uh, Japanese guideline does mention the period from the onset. I mean, the, the almost all cases in Japan are transferred to the hospital and uh, operated within 24 hours. But the uh, condition in India is uh, uh, different from Japan. And uh, the, some cases uh, uh, require a long time to have the operation. The, the, I think the, in my the personal experience in the India, the 32 hours within 32 hours operation is important, important uh, indication for the surgery, uh, for the endoscopic surgery as well. And also the severe patient with massive hemorrhage might be the, the surgical indication, but uh, sometimes become the social indication. These are same as, uh, I think the same, Japan and uh, India as well. Uh, next, I talk about the method of the endoscopic ICH evacuation. The, uh, the case is a terminal hemorrhage. The, the usually position, the uh, supine position, the head uh, slightly elevated. Craniotomy is made at the uh, uh, coccus point. Uh, the diameter is usually 20 millimeter. And uh, uh, the surgery was performed using the cylinder we use the new report, which is the transparent seat, and the diameter is 10 millimeter. And uh, this cylinder was uh, directed to the hematoma cavity, 
and uh, it is directed to the extra auditory canal uh, panel to the uh, midline. And the uh, hematoma evacuation is performed under the visualization of the rigid endoscope. I prefer to use the gel and zero degree four millimeter uh, rigid endoscope. Also the suction, we can use the special suction in Japan. The, the, this is the suction, but it also has the irrigation and the monophora functions. The using this, uh, oh, sorry, the, this using this by using this suction, the hemostasis can be achieved as well. And the uh, endoscopic application can be perf uh, usually performed by the freehand technique. It means that the surgeon has the endoscope on the left hand and also the uh, have the suction on the right hand. Assistant hold the neural pot transparent cyst gently. So by use, using the freehand technique, the transparent cyst and the endoscope can be mobilized freely to evacuate the whole hematoma. I just present uh, some cases. Uh, the first one is the uh, abdominal hemorrhage. For this case, the hematoma was evacuated under the uh, rigid endoscope. The video is shown. The endoscope and the transparent cyst was uh, inserted into the hematoma cavity. And then the hematoma was started to evacuate. So the only hematoma was evacuated without uh, damaging the normal brain tissue. The transparent cyst was mobilized to remove the whole hematoma. And uh, uh, this is the hematoma behind the uh, cyst. It was also evacuated and the irrigation can be achieved. And, uh, now we can see the small vessels. Probably it was the uh, bleeding point and it was coagulated by using the monopolar suction. The whole hematoma was evacuated. After confirmation, the, the cyst was removed. And significant decompression was achieved. Uh, Post-operative CT showed the uh, uh, excellent decompression after hematoma evacuation. Uh, sometimes the arterial bleeding is confirmed during the operation. This is the case of the arterial bleeding. Now we can see the uh, bleeding from the perforator the, by using this uh, monopora suction the, this bleeding point was slowly, slowly coagulated using ir irrigation. The uh, uh, bipolar also can be used for the hemostasis, but uh, because of the continuous bleeding, I prefer to use the uh, this uh, uh, hematoma suction. Uh, this is almost uh, hemat hemostasis is almost achieved. Uh, <coughs> now I think. Uh,
Now the uh, hemostasis, hemostasis was achieved. The, for the intraventricular hematoma, the, we have the two type of the surgery. The first one is the a surgery using a rigid ventricular scope. The second one is the uh, surgery using the flexible ventricular scope. First, I showed the, the surgery using the rigid ventricular scope. This is the case that uh, intraventricular hematoma with non communicating hydrocephalus. For this case, the endoscopic third ventricular stomy was performed under the rigid ventricular scope. The <coughs> endoscope was inserted into the anterior hole of the lateral ventricle first, and the hematoma around the from a Monroe was evacuated from the working channel. And then now we can identify the foramen mondo. And the foramen mondo was uh, occupied with the hematoma. Uh, so the hematoma here was also uh, evacuated from the working channel by using a cylinder. And uh, after the evacuation, uh, we can see the inside of the third ventricle. And uh, now we can see the floor of the third ventricle clearly. So the, the ETB is started from the uh, puncture with the forceps. And then this uh, this hole was uh, directed from the uh, directed by using the uh, for the catheter uh, a for the catheter. The stoma was uh, <coughs> widely expanded, and then we can see the uh, vaginal artery. After the surgery, the uh, CF, CSS circulation was improved and the uh, EBD was removed after two days. Uh, another case is the interventricular hematoma, the hematoma, a uh, massive hematoma with uh, non communicating hydrocephalus. For this case, the uh, two approaches were performed through the uh, anterior horn and the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. Now this is the view from the anterior horn. Now we can see the uh, hematoma in the lateral ventricle. And uh, this is the from a mondo. The south ventricle is also the dilated. And the septostomy was performed by using the more porous action. Then also the hematoma in the contralateral side was also evacuated. And the hematoma in the ipsilateral side of the lateral ventricle was well evacuated. And then the a uh, rigid ventricle scope was introduced to see the inside the third ventricle. The floor of the third ventricle is al already open in this case. The rigid membrane was uh, only the rigid membrane was opened. And this is the bajrat and the shade and sub now. And also the hematoma in the inferior horn was also evacuated. Uh, this is the hematoma in the trigon and the uh, uh, 
posterior horn. The, after the operation, the <coughs> supratentral hemat intraventricular hematoma was well evacuated and the EBD was removed after two days. The, also, the, in Japan, the flexible videoscope is available. So the intraventricular, for the intraventricular hematoma, the flexible uh, videoscope is used. This is a case, terminal uh, hemorrhage with the interventricular hematoma. For this case, the ICH was uh, evacuated and the rigid endoscope, and then the <coughs> interventricular hematoma uh, was evacuated by the uh, flexible endoscope. First, the ICH was evacuated under the uh, rigid endoscope. After the evacuation, the endoscope was directed to the uh, lateral ventricle. And then the irrigation was started. And uh, here is the <coughs> choroid plexus. The, also, the this is the inside of the South ventricle. The flex, flexible endoscope can proceed the uh, posterior south ventricle. The hematoma in the posterior south ventricle was also evacuated. Then we can see the structure in the posterior south ventricle. Yeah, in the orifice of the aqueduct. The hematoma in the aqueduct was also evacuated and uh, the endoscope proceed to the uh, fourth ventricle. The inside the fourth ventricle was well irrigated and uh, the hematoma in the third and the fourth ventricle was almost clear now. Then the endoscope returned to the lateral ventricle and the hematoma in the lateral ventricle was also evacuated. And then this is the final view of the, this surgery. Uh, Post-operatively, the almost all the hematoma was evacuated. And finally, the, uh, the cerebral hemorrhage, the, this operation, the, the method is different, a uh, little bit different. Uh, patient is placed in the supine lateral position. The a small craniotomy is made uh, at the midpoint between the muscle tip and the inion. And the uh, EBD is placed at the fragile point. Uh, usually, the, in Japan, the decompressive craniotomy is not required. But uh, uh, I know that in India, the, sometimes the, the, uh, we encounter the, uh, the cases of the developed edema. So I think the, in India, the case selection must be done carefully. Uh, this is the case of the left cerebral hemorrhage with non-communicating hydrocephalus. Uh, for this case, the cerebral hematoma was evacuated under the rigid endoscope. And then the hematoma in the south ventricle was evacuated under the flexible endoscope. The video is shown. And this is the cerebral hematoma. The amount of the cerebral hematoma is usually uh, less than the supratentorial hematoma.
and then the the flexible endoscope was introduced and we can identify the the pathway to the fourth ventricle and the, the flexible endoscope uh, hematoma was irrigated inside in the fourth ventricle so then the, we can identify the white structure uh, it is the floor of the fourth ventricle now the uh, we can identify the midline here's the midline and uh, this is the uh, orifice of the aqueduct and uh, it was occupied by the hematoma and this hematoma was also evacuated and then the endoscope proceeded to the inside of the third ventricle the inside of the south ventricle was well irrigated again. And finally, we can see the from and mondo behind the massa intermedia. And then the <coughs> endoscope returned to the fourth ventricle and uh, directed to the uh, Roman Lushka. Here is the ninth knob and the pico uh, through the Roman Lushka. Now also we can see the uh, choroid plexus and the roof of the fourth ventricle. The post-operatively, the <coughs> hematoma was well evacuated. Hydrocephalus was improved. Uh, in my opinion, the endoscope uh, can evacuate the uh, intracranial and the interventricular hematoma very well. But the uh, question is, always question is the, whether the functional recovery by endoscopic hematoma evacuation is better than craniotomy. The, I introduced the two uh, articles the first one is uh, 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 both the article came from the China. The first one is a randomized trial in single entity. They compared the surgical result uh, in the endoscopy, uh, cell tactic aspiration, and the cryotonic groups. And they concluded that, that the lowest complication, the mortality rate, and the highest functional recovery in endoscopic groups. And the second article is the uh, it is published in Stroke in 2012, the a meta-analysis of the randomized controlled trials. So the data is much reliable, uh, and uh, they compared the two groups, minimally invasive surgery group and uh, other treatment option. The the this article concluded that. Uh, minimal invasive surgery may benefit from more other treatment options in limited conditions in terms of the reduction of death and the dependent rate. But uh, <clears throat> this uh, mini, minimally invasive surgery group include, uh, including the endoscopic and the stereotactic surgery cases. So the, this is not the pure in investigation of the endoscopic surgery. So still, uh, in my opinion, the still further investigation regarding fun functional recovery by the endoscopic hematoma evacuation are required. And uh, this is the data I published uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I just compared the uh, the EBD period, uh, placement period uh, in cases of the intraventricular hematoma. The, the first group is the extraventricular uh, drainage only. The second group is the endoscopy plus EBD group. And uh, the result was the 
after the endoscopy, endoscopic surgery, uh, significant reduction of the uh, EBD placement period was confirmed. In conclusion, the endoscopic application hematoma is an alternative option for the intracerebral and the intraventricular hemorrhage. And the endoscopic IVH evacuation significantly reduced the EBD placement period. And, but uh, in my opinion, further investigation regarding functional recovery after endoscopic hematoma evacuation are needed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Komatsu, for this excellent presentation. Uh, is Dr. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Yadav? Yes, yes. Would you like to discuss this uh, with Dr. Uh, Komatsu? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, excellent uh, demonstration of the technique, uh, good results. And uh, um, one question is uh, that you are a suction and those suction and uh, monopolar so yeah. is it available in the market uh, yeah it? yeah but uh, it's only the available in japanese market in india it's not uh, available because uh, i agree with this that single hand surgery uh, without uh, having uh, coagulation so in one instrument, you have to have uh, mm, suction and coagulation. Then only it is possible. Otherwise, it is difficult uh, if there is a bleeding. Uh, another concern is, do you come across any, uh, I mean, severe hemorrhage where you find difficulty or the suction may get blocked and difficulty in visualization in any of your surgery? Uh. You mean the the severe hemorrhage, and then you are uh, because uh, you are not able to attain the hemostasis. Uh, bleeding is more. Bleeding is more, and uh, you find it difficult. Yeah. The normal ICH cases, I think, the all cases can be uh, managed by the this kind of the technique. But uh, aneurysmal or ABM, such cases, I cannot control the bleeding. But uh, I see it's cases. I think that yeah. this suction is very uh, reliable. That we can control the almost all the bleeding. I think. Can I ask one question? Yes. Suresh, yes. Yes. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah it's it's an excellent talk, uh, Dr. Komatsu. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. So my, my question is that uh, regarding the outcomes, clinical outcomes of the patients, mm -hmm. uh, because if you look at large randomized studies, there mm -hmm. have been two major studies. One is of course the stitch trial, which compared the surgical versus non-surgical treatment. Mm -hmm. And other is an endoscopic randomized trial by all et al. Mm -hmm. And basically the stitch trial has concluded uh, that it was not very sure whether surgery is effective or conservative treatment is effective. Mm -hmm. And the reason being that the number needed to calculate, they felt mm -hmm. was much more larger. Mm -hmm. And they had randomized 1000 patients, 500 and our center, you know, I was the mm -hmm. part of stitch trial and we had contributed almost uh, 60 cases. And mm -hmm. all my cases were endoscopic actually, which I contributed to uh, stitch trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I discussed with uh, Dr. Mendeley, uh, the main PI, he said the main problem with stitch trial is that they still feel that the number, uh, the sample size uh, mm. should be at least around 5,000 in order for us to get come to a reasonable conclusion, mm -hmm. which means that uh, we cannot uh, do this study in any one particular institute, but a multi-institutional study will be required. Mm -hmm. So uh, what is your opinion regarding so that's why I'm very skeptical about the randomized trial yeah. by the Chinese. Yeah, 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 because I agree. I agree with your opinion. And but, uh, yeah, in my opinion, the India, only India has a possibility to conclude this uh, uh, result, this, uh, this investigation. I think that India has a huge opportunity. But uh, in, in terms, thank you. But in terms yeah. of outcome, 
what is your opinion uh, i think yeah your... in my opinion the mm, it's probably probably the surgical result and the surgical prognosis will be same between the uh, endoscopic group and the other uh, surgical group i think i think so the only the endoscopic method is uh, i think the, the it's surely minimally invasive and the reduce the surgical time but the probably surgical prognosis pro prognosis the patient probably same it's depend on the uh, damage of the brain fast damage of the brain initial damage of the brain i think so okay we have uh, professor kozuito with us professor kozuito you... hello yes yeah yes do you want to make any comment on this any yes. any uh, any effect on the outcome following the endoscopy uh i agree with uh, the professor komatsu but uh, uh the in the stitch trial the most important problem is uh, duration between the onset to surgery in japan the most ic removal surgery was performed within uh, uh, maybe eight hours or less than that but in stitch trial uh, duration is very long so uh, that is the most uh, uh, important problem all right so uh, in short uh, we need to have more numbers as uh, suggested yeah by yeah sarat chanda to to have some uh, meaningful conclusion is that right yeah we have one uh, question from uh, dr katikar he is from uh, solapur he wants to ask um, uh, about the large clots in fourth ventricle or hemorrhagic dilatation of the fourth ventricle which is usually having a very poor prognosis in spite of excellent evacuation of ivh your comment please fourth ventricular hemorrhage Dr. Komatsu. Ah, you asking to me? Yes. yes, yes. Okay, okay. The you mean the fourth ventricle he hematoma? Yes. Uh, due to the cerebral hematoma. Yes. Cerebral hematoma. Yeah, I think the after the evacuation of the uh, fourth ventricle hematoma, I think the prognosis is better. Pro prognosis prognosis is good. Hmm. Okay. I think Dr. Bhagat Singh wants to ask. Dr. Yeah. Bhagat Singh is. for the terminal hemorrhage he use use the long axis you put the bar hole in the frontal and use the long axis along the hemorrhage where you start removing the hematoma first from the distal or from the sometimes we are the view got obstructed when partially we remove the hematoma so whether to start from the distal and uh, proceed to the proximal or to you start removing the hematoma proximally and go distally i want technical issue to how you start your removing the hematoma distal to proximal or proximal to proceed further ah i prefer to remove the hematoma from the proximal to distal and also i approach from the cocas point cocas point yeah, it's a surgeon the preference so um, i think it's not in my opinion no. so you start... you prefer... sorry go ahead, go ahead. Least... Yeah. Uh, usually we start to remove it from the distal mm. and slowly just to remove and uh, proximally it is easy and the vision is very clear in uh, removing the total sometimes we go from the proximal many times we have some residual hematoma mm. and we are not able to complete the total section of the hematoma mm. Uh, from my point of view i have uh, observed this so. mm, my my thing but uh, <laughs> it may be true uh, but it will be blind if you go distally you will not be able to see you are within the hematoma so the endoscope will not give you any view except that you are talking about blind evacuation uh, from stereotactic method aspiration only and then clot lysis but in endoscope you have to have from proximal to distal if you go distally you will not be able to see anything blind aspiration is not advisable 
Yeah. So, okay, go ahead, please. Thanks. Okay, uh, then I think we move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Yadav. Can you just invite the next speaker and proceed with it? Uh, I think you go ahead, sir. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. All right. So, uh, our next uh, talk will be given by none other than our own uh, uh, committee member, uh, Professor Patak. And uh, we have uh, uh, done the introduction part of it. Uh, no, I'm, introduction I will give. So please, introduce. please introduce and I would like to invite Professor Patak for the next talk. Please go ahead. Okay. So it is a proud privilege for me to introduce my teacher, uh, Professor uh, Asis Patak, sir. Um, presently, he is a director uh, of neurosurgery at Fortis Hospital, uh, Mohali. Former, uh, he uh, worked in uh, PGI Chandigarh when he trained me. Uh, he is uh, he was consultant uh, pediatric neurosurgeon at Sheffield and consultant neurosurgeon at Hull UK with the designation of lead consultant vascular pituitary surgery and skull skull based surgeon. He has. Uh, innumerable uh, publications, more than 151 publication in index journals, 11 chapters, and uh, including a publication in neuroendoscopy. He has attended more than 311 uh, conferences uh, in India and abroad. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, he is well trained in um, endoscopy surgery including uh, his training in India and abroad. Professor Patak, sir. Can you hear me? Sir, sir. Yes, OK. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Yadav. It's a pleasure uh, to uh, share my experience uh, in this August gathering. gathering. Uh, we all talk about uh, doing endoscopic procedures in the brain, removing hematoma, clots, cystic lesion. Uh, parenchymal lesions are, of course, not a regular uh, sort of bread and butter. The first question which might come to everybody's mind is, why you need to go for endoscopic parenchymal excision when microscopy is so good? Well, is it a fancy or a fashion? Is it a show off? To address that, we have to find out why the objective of endoscopic parenchymal tumor excision. <clears throat> First of all, we are looking for minimally invasive procedure. We're looking for precision. We're looking for minimal distortion to the anatomy, quicker recovery, probably a shorter hospital stay in that way. And of course, indirectly, a less financial implication in the whole matter. Now, there would be certain advantages and disadvantages of each procedure. So let's talk about the microscope to compare with endoscope. We know that microscope uh, is a tool which is accustomed to all the surgeons. Its precision is good. The surgeon can use both hands. At the same time, the drawbacks are that as you go in the depth, the illumination becomes poor. The precision of the image gets compromised when you zoom it too much. The visual axis is straight. You cannot see it on the sides and the corners so well. So you need to have more retraction uh, to sort of visual, visualize things. Whereas the endoscope is considered as better in certain aspects. There's no loss of light as the source is very near to the lesion. The magnification is similar to the microscope. It can help in looking at the sides and margins using angled scopes. Retraction is limited that way and there's Definitely, it's a minimally invasive procedure through a narrow corridor. The drawbacks are you can have fogging, blood staining, difficult to visualize the uh, uh, because of the excessive bleeding sometimes, and there's a steep learning curve. Why then endoscopy is not being routinely used uh, for removing lesions in the brain? I'm, I'm talking of solid lesions now. Well, because as, as I told, it's an unfamiliar technique. There's a steep learning curve. And there's apprehension in the minds of the surgeons that there can be incomplete excision at of the deep seated lesion, which can happen even with microscopy also. So comparing the two, we have to 
compare certain points, the surgical time, the illumination and clarity, the magnification, the blood loss, the craniotomy size, the tumor bed hematoma, extent of excision, outcome and complications. And last of all, the important question, is it safe? Is it simple to do? We'll go step by step. Uh, in our setup, what we do as in all cases where we decide to go for endoscopy, we go for contrast MRI, ideally with the neuro navigation protocol. Standard neuroanesthetic procedures, we fix the head. And of course, we use the navigation system, which would help us to confirm the uh, position of the lesion or the tumor, and of course, fix our craniotomy site. The second thing is the dural opening is usually made in a cruciate fashion because we tend to do a small opening. The septum is very important. And here you use navigation guidance, either to decide through a shortest route, through a non-eloquent structure, and of course, now we have added using the disposition of the tracts in the DTI imaging, which is very, very important. The cortisectomy size has also to be optimal so that you can use an endoscope as well as manual instruments. And of course, under neuro navigation guidance, you can reach the depth and go for gradual dissection of lesions. So a few words about DTI. And you know, nowadays with the technology available in places where you can sort of have it, these are the dispersion of the fibers. So the lesion and the DTI, the, the imaging, when they're merged, you can find a route through which you can have a safer entry into the brain without really distorting the important fibers. Each fiber to me is important in the brain, uh, whether they're less eloquent or not, that's more uh, a different issue. And then of course, the initial debulking is performed first with the zero degree scope, which is mounted on an endoscope holder. So your hands are free actually. Subsequently, to me, 30 degree scope is very, very helpful, but it starts, you start seeing the surrounding wall. And as you remove, the lesion gradually comes into your field. So you don't have to use another uh, 45 degree or 70 degree scope in most of the cases. And the tumor excision follows the simple technique of cautery and suction and retraction is usually, now I'm going to controversial uh, topic in this. We use a very thin blade, which supports the lips of the incision and that we remove. An initial corticectomy is supported by a certain support. And here we just use simple glove strips because we found in the past there were some hemorrhages in the margin of the lips of the corticectomy. But this has, a, there's no subpile hemorrhage in this. Hemostasis is achieved in the usual manner and the dura is completely closed in most of the cases. So this is a classical case. Uh, here you can see there's a big lesion here. I'm just taking the DTI images. This is a DTI of the opposite side, the DTI of this side. This is a patient who came with hemiparis on the left side, the right side of DTI fibers. We gave steroids. We thought that it's a compression of the fibers, which should improve with steroids when the edema subsides, but it never improved. And here you can see all the DTI fibers are involved in, in, the, in the lesion. And here you can see on this side, the DTI fibers are cut off. So here the lesion has invaded into the, two, uh, the, the fibers. Uh, the, the corticospinal tract. And obviously the prognosis uh, uh, tells us that improvement might be suboptimal. So in this particular case, the lesion is mitotic. It's on right on the surface. It's just a three uh, centimeter stenotomy size. And we just use a single simple retractor with gently holding the lips. And we're entering entry the lesion and just simple suction diathermy. You don't need anything else to do. And it's more or less a suckable lesion with some amount of uh, tenacity in certain areas of the lesion. And as you sort of gradually remove, you gain more space. And I'm just uh, fast forwarding it. And you have removed the tumor from the anterior wall of it. And then of course, you go to the lateral side. This is the glove, uh, which is supporting the pile surface. And this is just a gentle retractor holding the lips. And you remove the lesion uh, from there. And as you gradually proceed removing the lesion, you'll find that you have already come to the tumor, tumor uh, brain interface. And see the small size of the corticotomy, which we have really done. And here you are there uh, into the uh, periphery of the lesion. This is the other side of the same uh, lesion where you are, sorry, yeah, yes. Where you are sort of removing the tumor from the surrounding area of the brain. And here, as you see, as you gradually remove, you get to the tumor brain interface and you can see the edematous brain tissue, which is coming to view. And that's how gradually you can get rid of the lesion. Now you can see the retraction has changed. So this is a 
sort of temporary retraction, which is not continuous, which is not producing any change in the brain. So you see the, the edematous brain now coming to the view. You have removed most of the lesion from all the sites. And that's the end, as you see gradually, the remaining uh, bits of the tumors are removed. I'm fast forwarding it to save some time. And at the end of the day, ultimately, when you remove the whole lesion, you'll see that the cavity is absolutely clean. And there you are, the, the tumor has been removed. So here the, the, the margin, the opening is just, I think 1.5 to two centimeters at the most. And that's what you achieve. And now come to this controversial discussion of tube versus uh, blade retractor system. I do admit that tubular retractor is very good for removing hematoma or an cystic lesion in the brain. But when it's come to the solid lesion, retraction of soft tissue is unavoidable. You have to do some retraction. The concept of tubular retraction is there for more than 30 years. And their efficacy and safety and all these things have been discussed uh, uh, in many articles. We know that excessive retraction often results in damage to the brain tissue. But normal brain retractors do not apply even distribution. We know that. Hence, we claim that it produces tissue damage. It is also claimed that tubular retractors offer advantage of low retraction pressure. And Professor Y.R. Yadav, who is here, has produced articles and really contributed by producing an excellent, simple uh, uh, tubular retractor in the Indian scenario. People have used serial dilatation technique, which I feel is more traumatic, actually. You're repeatedly trying to graze through the brain tissue, which I'm not sure is the ideal thing. People have used balloon to dilate, and I don't know whether that is the right thing to do. You're stretching all the fibers, and if you see the detailed images, you might be damaging more fibers by that. So to my mind, I'm not very sure whether the tubular retractors are the best thing, oh. other than intermittent retraction using a brain spatula with small size, which is there. And to substantiate this, there's an article in 2018, which says they've used this tubular retractor system. And they say that brain spatula can provide larger operative fields for observing the interface between the lesion and the normal tissue rather than the tubular retractors. There's disadvantage of tubular retractor because there's limitation of working space. The brain spatula compensates this disadvantage and provides minimal invasive surgery by becoming the viewing sort of structure. We can sort of help you to see things Moving the tubular retractor to and from rocking it also is not the ideal thing to do. And this is the only study of its kind where they've used restricted diffusion on DWI to see how much there's brain damage. Going further into the retraction of the brain, which is of course related to neuroendoscopy, they've seen that brain retraction up to 30 minutes does not cause any significant risk of induced damage. And the peak retraction pressure level indicates that intermittent retraction is a safer procedure as compared to continuous retraction. So continuous retraction, intermittent retraction. And we know that the brain damage appears at retraction force of 30 grams and increases in proportion to the force used. An electrocorticogram done shows there is full recovery after release of retraction if the retraction force is less than 40 grams. Whereas intermittent retraction the damage is minimal with a retraction force of less than 50 grams. So it can tolerate more retraction in the intermittent variety. And electrocorticogram evidence of recovery was prompt when you use intermittent retraction. So you see, we, we follow this idea that intermittent retraction with limited pressure will give a good access, give a good view. So rigid conduit, conduit has been claimed to be less harmful as compared with normal brain retractor. We, there's a question mark for us here. Constant pressure on the brain, rather, with a, whether you use a conduit or anything else, as you dilate it, there's ischemic insult to the surrounding tissue through the pathway through which you go. So use a pulsatile retractor combined with latex gloves lining provides the advantage of minimal retraction effect and allows the desired exposure. And that is our experience over the years. So this is now we are going to certain cases. As you can see, uh, this particular case uh, we have entered into and uh, you can see the clarity of the image, the visualization, and you can angle your scope to different uh, directions to uh, get into the lesion as you want to do. And this is again a two centimeter lesion. Uh, and this is, as you enter into the tumor, you sort of debulk it and 
you can gradually even you can in, introduce a patty here as you can see a small patty can be introduced to control any small minor bleeding which is happening in different areas and you can go to the limits of the tumor and you can see the edematous brain tissue and then of course you sort of start gradually separating the tumor from the corners and here you see the normal brain tissue is already being seen and that is how you can gradually uh, almost go for a total excision in most of the cases and this is the tumor tissue interface as you can see where you can very clearly sort of uh, remove the uh, gradually dissect away the periphery of the tumor from the surrounding normal brain and that's ultimately at the end of the day you can achieve so in, in our opinion just a single retraction is good enough sometimes because as you dig into the lesion you can get into a wider space and you don't need to do much retraction related to that uh, this is our uh, publication which we have tried to uh, uh, put forward for the beginners and we have made comparison of endoscopic and microscopic excision the factors which were considered was surgical time illumination and clarity magnification blood loss craniotomy size and tumor bed hematoma one thing we found that regarding illumination and visibility though microscope gives better resolution on the surface the deeper in corridor the light becomes less this poor resolution in the deeper areas and this problem is compounded by the instruments coming the way whereas the endoscope of course the optical resolution is much better and there is enhanced visibility even at the depth so the clarity is much more in that apart from the other factors like hematoma the amount of blood loss all are comparable or sometimes even better with endoscopy and the of course the craniotomy is much small and you are doing a minimally invasive procedure to take you forward through some examples now this is a man this is a surface lesion and surface lesions are fun you can see this is the scope holder which is holding the scope so i'll again fast forward this lesion we just uh, with the endoscope you this is this is the high grade glioma which is on the surface so gradually you dissect the lesion from the surrounding brain tissue and as you see what looks like normal brain tissue you can gradually remove the lesion and at, uh, gradually with your dissection if you are careful you can separate the lesion slowly and gradually and take it there uh, this video has stopped working i don't know why uh yes so there you see um, the uh, the margin between the tumor and the normal uh, brain matter so same surgical time and you remove the lesion that that's, that's the last bit which is being coagulated so this was a surgical time of 1 hour 50 minutes skin to skin blood loss was normal clarity illumination magnification very good no hematoma no bleeding problems and of course uh, the patient had no deficit this of course is a fun for any endoscopy person 67 years old male presented with headaches this is a cystic lesion with a maroon nodule so you just make a small hole and uh, uh, with a burr hole or practically you enter into the lesion and as you uh, sort of evacuate the fluid here into the cavity of the tumor that's the maroon nodule which is uh, coming into the view so Uh, you gradually separate the maroon nodule by teasing it from the surrounding brain and then as the vessels which are supplying the maroon nodule come into the picture you gradually sort of uh, remove that and and uh, get rid of the maroon nodule once you have removed everything you have a good look all around the cavity and the procedure is done so this was again 1 hour 50 minutes blood loss was normal clarity illumination magnification very good no hematoma or bleeding this is the post operative ct scan so it, you can have a good view all around and the craniotomy size was half it was like a small burr hole actually which could help us to do the procedure this is a 27 years old female and as you can see there's a left sided dominant hemisphere lesion and this is calcified on the mri you can make out so this is a diffuse image which is calcified and we knew that it's calcified we were uh, not sure whether we go for a endoscopic surgery in this case because you, we knew it is going to be tough yes it is a tough lesion and uh, when we entered into the lesion uh, here we are using just uh, use of two gentle uh, uh, fine retractors it's a tough lesion you can see and this is a heavily calcified lesion so we tried uh, initial uh, suction and cusa also we tried which didn't really work and uh, 
So you see, now you have to use a, a ronger, this all the calcified stuff, which is stuck here. So one might debate whether we use an endoscope or a microscope, but we could manage to excise all the lesion. It's, it, it's not coming out so easily. It's badly stuck to the surrounding the brain. Not the ideal thing to sort of manage with an endoscope. Uh, probably a bigger incision would be better, but we somehow could manage this particular lesion. And then uh, so the surgical time was two hours, 15 minutes. This is the post-operative picture of the tumor cavity. Blood loss was normal. Clarity, illumination, magnif magnification, very good. No hematoma or bleeding. Advantage of a good view all around. The craniotomy size was 50% of normal. And uh, this patient being on the dominant side, we knew uh, there can be some complications. Developed hemiparesis, which lasted for a few weeks. And there was some dysphagia, which also improved with time. And this is the follow-up MRI of this particular patient who is doing extremely well now. This is a 25 years old female who present with seizures and in some other place, somebody just did a biopsy saying that is low grade glioma, nothing much needs to be done. But you have to also understand this usually falls in the category of high risk low grade glioma. This is a big lesion. She kept on having repeated seizures, uncontrolled epilepsy. And we decided that we need to remove this. There was already a craniotomy there. So uh, we opened the same craniotomy and with the endoscope, we removed the whole lesion it took three hours, 25 minutes, minimal blood loss, clarity, elimination, very good, no hematoma, Trinitomy size was standard as before. There was, uh, the, the course was uneventful. He was, the patient was discharged. She, there's a lady, this was discharged within two days and her seizures have been now well under control now with medications. So given the scenario, the things to watch for include the maneuvering of the endoscope and the instruments, which have to be gentle. There's a risk of retraction injury uh, to the normal parenchyma around. Do not hesitate to use a spatula if endoport or tubular retractor does not give easy access. The microscope should remain as a standby option. So we should not have the ego that we have to remove all these difficult lesions definitely with our endoscope if, if we are struggling. Patient selection is very important. Patients, all patients are not ideal. So if there's a major calcification, highly vascular lesion, giant lesions, where you have to really wobble your endoscope too much this way, that way. Lesions with wide base, like meningioma, where you go for Simpson's grading and remove a wide base, might not be ideal for endoscope. And of course, multi-compartment multi lesions, and we are talking of solid lesions here, are not ideal for this case. Going through the literature, <clears throat> we found uh, <clears throat> Otsuki, total case 15, Total excision was in seven, and they were all three to 26 millimeter. And the partial excision, two were highly vascular lesions. Kassam, in a series of 21 cases, which a mixed bag of different lesions, achieved total excision in eight and near total in six. So 14 cases, good excision, and seven partial excision. One patient is infection and one pulmonary emboli. Joe et al. in 2011 had 21 cases, of which 66% were total excision and four partial excision, and three cases he could not excise. He probably resorted to some other technique. Plaha, who has got the biggest series of 48 cases, which is again a mixed bag of different pathology, has a total excision in 48% and 52% near total excision. So this is the series which has got a good outcome in most of the cases. Oops. And in our series, till now, we have follow-up of 19 cases, which is a mixed bag of different lesions. We have achieved near total excision to near total excision 15. Four, of course, we had to resort to partial excision because of the hematoma and bleeding in the tumor. So is there an advantage of endoscopic parenchymal solid tissue uh, tumor excision? Yes, we have good illumination, magnification, and good clarity. There's good definition of structures and tissue interface. There's better viewing of surrounding areas. There's no extra risk of bleeding or hematoma compared to microscopic procedure. There's a smaller exposure, and of course, that helps in a uh, shorter stay if everything goes well. I have got a suggestion uh, for the beginners. Anybody who wants to take up this sort of uh, challenging uh, surgery has to first acquire the expertise of endoscopy through workshops and simulations. You should also gain exposure to live endoscopic procedures by assisting somebody who is well experienced. Start with a simple surface lesion or a cystic lesion, perhaps that's going to give you the confidence to 
go forward. Evaluate your outcome and compare with the microscopic procedures. And always, just forget your ego, keep a microscope as a standby, so that if anything happens, you can immediately take care of it. So I would conclude here by saying that endoscopic brain lesion excision is safe alternative procedure. Smaller size of craniotomy and the narrow corridor of entry is sufficient and it allows bimanual manipulation of the tumor with clear visibility of the hidden corners. Endoscope allows better clarity of the lesion because of the proximity of the scope to the lesion surface. Selected entry through corticosectomy using a safe surgical corridor under neuro navigation guidance gives an easy access and now I add the DTI images also superimposed on the normal MRI. The technique therefore is minimally invasive and strictly adheres to the proven principles, neuro microsurgical principles. There's a word of caution here. It needs learning curve, has to be done in greater numbers to gain expertise. Proper case selection is important for success. But at the end, I would like to say that learning endoscopic tumor excision using the endoscope is probably now the prelude for the use of exoscope, which is very much there and probably is going to the future replacement of many of the microsurgical procedures also. Thank you for your patient hearing. Professor Yadav. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so excellent talk, sir. Um, it has been a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, you are right, uh, but for intermittent um, retraction using uh, the uh, MNR, uh, other retractors, Lela retractor is all right. Um, in tubular retractor, if you have rigid, the problem with the most of the tubular retractors are that these are rigid, rigid tubular retractors. So if you have a retractor which are very soft, like uh, my retractor, it is of silicone and of 1.5 millimeter thickness. So once there is some pressure from the surrounding, it collapses. So hardly it, uh, the idea is that it holds the brain, does not retract. So that is what should be there. But um, you have rightly said that the other method by intermittent uh, using retractor for short period may be all right. The other advantage of tubular retractor, which I, I, I'm doing, I have removed more than 100 uh, deep-seated tumors, deep-seated. The other thing which I think is the advantage uh, for endoscope is if you have a deep lesion, it is better for superficial reasons. Uh, I don't know whether uh, what is to be done. It can be done with the microscope and with the endoscope both. Um, so these are my few of the comments. The tubular retractors, the one more advantage of tubular retractor is if there is a small ooze, then you just gently pu push it down. The Because of the tamponade defect of these uh, tubular retractor, the bleeding stops. So one more advantage of tubular retractor, but your work is excellent, sir. Uh, we appreciate. Um, sir, Sankla, sir, please. Yeah, so uh, you want to respond to any of these comments? Dr. No, 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 I mean, the comments are all pertinent. The only thing is that we have to understand uh, the deep-seated lesions again, if, there, if there's a bleeding, you know, and that uh, and sometimes there are vessels which cannot be so easily just uh, controlled by tamponade. And if you are ultimately, when you're leaving that field, you have to be very, very careful that the hemostasis has been perfect. And the tumor interface, I find, uh, with a, the, the working channel becomes very narrow. Uh, and with a small working channel with a deep-seated thalamic lesion, which is big enough, sometimes it might become a, a bit of struggle. So. Uh, that's the way we, you feel comfortable about it. Is the only thing. Right. Professor Komar, yeah. do you have any comments? Yeah, I want to ask the instrument about the instrument. The, the, All do, micro you use, the, the, do you use any special instrument for this kind of the surgery? The, yeah. Most of the 
it's meant the uh, same as the microscopic surgery. Yes, most of the instruments are same like microscopic surgery, but our uh, bipolar forceps are very thin uh, bipolar forceps. And of course, the suction are the most uh, narrow but long suctions which can go to the depth. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, even the forceps, we use this very micro forceps which are used to hold. But on the endoscopy, you look, they look quite zoomed out, but they are mm -hmm. very finer instruments. And uh, regarding the uh, lesions on the surface, all lesions are not on the surface. Some lesions are subcortical. And there you have to see where you are going through. Are you going through the fibers as per the DTI disposition? Mm -hmm. Can you avoid any resection of any fibers, longitudinal or horizontal? So that that would give the optimal chance of the patient of not having any deficit, which might be subtle also. So that's what we follow in our cases. Excellent presentation. Uh, sorry. Can I make a comment? Uh, yes, yes, sir. So it's an excellent presentation, sir. Uh, my only comment is that I think at some point of time, it's very important for us to think minimally invasive for every pathology. And there has to be a beginning. So gliomas traditionally, you know, people would say microscope craniotomies, but the reason is why when you can do minimally invasive, that's the way you should go for the same thing what happened when, you know, I designed the endoscopic hemispherotomy. So when I used to present it in the international league and all that, people used to say, what is the problem? You can do it with the large craniotomy. But then people, you know, slowly they started appreciating that small openings definitely have an added advantage. So they definitely know. The finances recovery, the post of fevers are less. Patients, they start improving from next day onwards. Psychologically, it has a huge impact on the patient's mindset. You know, they feel that maybe it's not such a big surgery. So I think from that perspective for gliomas, I really appreciate. Uh, I, think, I think we have to now switch on to exoscope in due course of time, which is very much there. Yeah, that's what I was coming to. That that would be an added advantage if you if you get used to all these sort of procedures. Exoscope would be a very simple thing and routine thing then. One more thing, Ashish. Uh, you know, when you are talking about the parenchymal tumor surgery, particularly gliomas and all that, you do uh, you know rely on many other surgical adjuncts. For example, intraoperative ultrasonography. Uh, using of using. I'm 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 using I'm 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 using uh, the the. Let me finish. Yeah. Yeah. Five LA, PUSA, which you miss during the tubular surgery. I don't know how do you feel about it. Yeah, uh, we we are using neuro navigation very heavily, and now we have added DTI. We are using the yellow dye, the fluorescent dye for tumor excision. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the last case which I did after excision, just for the sake of being sure, I injected fluorescent dye. We don't have the fluorescent facility with our endoscope. But we brought, I just brought in the microscope with, and injected the fluorescent dye to see that whether I have removed everything. And I found that everything is gone. Uh, I was having a little bit of doubt in my mind. So, yes, I mean, that we are, we are using fluorescent dye routinely for all glyma patients. Professor Yadav, your comment about using these adjuncts. Sir, there is a question, sir. There is a question from uh, Bangalore. Yeah, uh, smaller exposure, click precludes intraoperative functional mapping. Therefore, lesion in or adjacent to allocant regions are not suitable. Your comment, sir. Uh, yeah, sir. Def definitely. Definitely, uh, uh, as I said, we had one patient in which the lesion was in the premotor area. And as you saw, the uh, DTI showed where already it had involved the fibers of the corticospinal tract as it was very much seen in DTI. So yes, if the lesion is in an eloquent area, which has already involved the important fibers, and now we can really track them even before surgery. So obviously there would be risks involved. And in that case, the strategies would be to do, if you know that it is a high grade lesion, to go for suboptimal excision, leaving a slither of the tumor adherent to the important cortex a certain area. And then, of course, subject the patient to radiotherapy and chemotherapy and whatever is needed. And um, can I make a comment, sir? And yes. give the quality, better quality, maintain the quality of life of the patient. Yes, sir. Sir, very nicely put, sir. Now, I've had a huge experience of dealing with eloquent areas, especially epilepsies arising from eloquent areas. Yes. Now, what I found 
is that it's not the surface mapping which is most important yes you need to know which is an entry point but it is the deeper cortical fibers which have a ten tendency to get involved or get damaged and for that i found this suction cum stimulation uh, instrument to be very very useful especially when you are removing the deeper part so you put the mep on the high threshold and whenever you are going uh, to the eloquent area the electrophysiologist will tell you that you are close to yes. the cortical fiber that provides definitely provides a window of opportunity to go minimally invasive even in eloquent areas because ultimately when you are working in the deeper areas you have the suction you will be able to monitor the cortical fibers no so many people forget that when we are dealing with eloquent it's not the surface which is important it's the deep deeper cortical fibers which can cause maximum damage cortical yeah i mean, i tend to leave a slither of the tumor deliberately especially malignant lesions why why uh, sort of risk anything like that we have got intraoperative neurophysiology for many other things and we do not deliberately sort of spend a lot of time on electrophysiology in this particular situation because we know their malignant lesions they are already diagnosed on radiology we have already done perfusion scan mr perfusion and uh, we have done already spect so uh, why unnecessary struggle all these things okay uh, there is no yes sir one more question maybe is uh, professor patak can answer it mm -hmm. which one is that so uh, one doctor from delhi is asking yeah. what is advantage over microscope for superficial lesion no it, it's not the question of microscope is going minimally invasive we have to make a smaller incision and we just remove the lesion and the recovery is fast within two days the patient goes home in microscope we probably have to make a bigger incision and then of course you are using a much bigger instruments in that as has been discussed so it's a question of getting used to a technology which will give you minimally invasive whether superficial or deep doesn't matter right bhagat saying you have something yes regarding the additional tool fluorescence and we are not routinely using uh, icg during this covid period i used for four or five cases some for uh, subcortical lesions i used uh, i don't have the endoscope of 4 mm uh, the endoscope used for the gastrointestinal surgery i used it i uh, definitely in the deeper side i am not very confident about that uh, margins but identifying the vessels inside deep when we remove the tumor icg is very useful so uh, for the past four or five cases during uh, we have, uh, have a time to work on this during the covid period so i used it i used the icg as a additional tool for the not for the not just for the margin and localization but definitely it localize the deep vessel we try to right. separate the vessel from the deep pair when we used it deeply when we are deep looking a uh, subcortical deep lesion it's identify the vessel definitely it useful icg is useful i know but endoscopically using yes the endoscopy the endoscopy i used it in the endoscopy but that's from the gastroenterology yeah. department you said yeah that endoscope i am planning to buy that 4 mm scope now at present currently it is a 10 mm, mm scope mm. yeah that is very useful it's not we are not going into the nose or into the brain but in the surface lesion and also to locate the margin as well as the vessels that invading by the tumor that's very nicely mapped we are able to identify that is useful that we also have a professor uh, kazuito with us uh, who has a huge experience in endoscopic animal tumor surgery professor kazuito uh yes yeah please comment on the yeah, yeah. uh i think the biggest advantage of the endoscope is uh, uh, uh visualization even under the water uh so uh, uh after the removal of the, of the tumor uh i usually fill up with water and com uh, confirm the complete hemostasis and the residual tumor under water uh, uh after the filling up with water the uh tumor bit uh expand very naturally without any additional uh, 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 detraction. So I, I think it's very useful for your surgery. Do you use such kind of uh, technique? Uh, I don't know. What about uh, Dr. Patak? What's the question actually? Uh, the question of the I, water. Water, fill up with yeah, water. Yeah. But as I already showed you, 
the endoscope definitely gives a very good brain tumor interface. Yeah. And if you take the scope and direct it, and 30 degree scope is very helpful. You put the 30 degree scope, you then have enough space to work in the direction where the scope is directed. We can then gradually see a very nice brain and tumor interface, which probably in a high resolution or high magnification microscope, sometimes you can be disillusioned. So for me, that's an added tool and advantage to differentiate between the tumor and the normal brain. And in this particular situation, the spatula retractor, if you use it on those areas where you are trying to separate the tumor from the surrounding brain is very helpful. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Your question? Yeah. Yeah, but, but I think the, uh, of course, a 30 degree endoscope or 70 degree endoscope is very useful in your surgery. But uh, uh, in the very shallow tumor, the uh, brain parenchyma go down if you use a uh, spatula. So it's very not difficult our experience. To, uh, That's not uh, to see around. No, we uh, need so a gentle, gentle I think retraction the, for a short period and we can make out. It, it's just okay. by experience you learn. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Fuminari, any question from you? No, no, it's okay. Okay. Already. Okay. If Thank I you. understood the, the question of uh, uh, then uh, filling up with the water you think will prevent uh, the falling of uh, brain collapse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Collapse. Okay. So for that, uh, it's a nice idea. And what I use uh, with the tubular retractor, it is also um, it is a problem. Once you have a very big uh, deep seated lesion, even intraventricular lesion, I use tubular retractor. So in two cases, I found that the brain was falling. So what I did was I took a night um, uh, stitch. And it stitch it to the dura. So once you stitch to the dura, then the superficial brain will not fall. So otherwise, it was causing problem in stability of my even tubular retractor. So I think that uh, that trick uh, works. The arachnoid stitch to the dura prevents brain falling deep in very large lesions. Okay, I, I understood the question now. In this case, that is what I'm saying. A very small blade retractor, spatula retractor, even two retractors for a short while is not a bad idea. Correct, sir. Professor yeah. Yadav, without just uh, a simple you question from you, just a second here. If you uh, uh, do, you uh, come across any any situation where you have to switch over from tubular retractor to microscope? Any situation? Yes. <laughs> Uh, but I have found the answer many situations it has come. There were situations in the past in the deep seated tumors when I was operating, uh, not for very small lesions of two centimeters. I operate huge big lesions uh, with the endoscope, uh, deep seated. So in the end, when you keep on uh, operating, take out the whole tumor, and then uh, you retract your tubular retractor, you start having uh, bleeding. So that is what Sir was saying, that it is not only tamponade. So what I'm saying is that tubular retractor helps in stopping the lesion, but ultimately you have to do a hemostasis. Otherwise, the moment you will uh, retract your tubular retractor, there will be bleeding. So I found in two, three cases, that uh, the bleeding was from all around and I was not sure from where, maybe in the hurry, I took out a tumor from everywhere without doing a good hemostasis. But now I, what I found even in the last case, big five centimeter intraventricular tumor going in the third ventricle, I did about six days back. So we removed it totally. Uh, but in the end, uh, when we try to close, there was some oozing. So perfect hemostasis was not there. Um, and then I have to switch on to uh, microscope and use conventional retractor also, because in one side, uh, so it is, uh, nothing is our enemy. See, if you find problem in endoscope, you use microscope. 
if you find uh, one side retraction, uh, these uh, conventional retractors are better. So these are something, but now I have found the answer that um, you just tilt the tubular retractor and you will find that uh, the bleeding coming from one side. Like in hematoma, how we can you know keep moving the, the tube all over places. So Sir, it is it is possible. The tubular retractor is there, mm -hmm. and uh, you have two hands. So with one uh, suction or any instrument, you you can uh, retract. Uh, I mean, applying a pressure on uh, left side wall of the tubular retractor, it will move on the left side, right side. So that way. I mean, uh, moving it to uh, medial, lateral, anterior, posterior, tubular retractor is not a problem, number one. Number two, when you are in the center of the tumor, the once you take out the tumor, everything falls um, towards the center where you are working. So there is hardly any retraction required, uh, but you can move also endoscope without uh, having a holder. It's not a problem, sir. Okay. Yeah, I think well said. I mean, we should not have any ego. If you have so, any problem, just bring the microscope. This has happened quite a few times for pituitary lesions also for me. I didn't feel comfortable with the oozing. I brought the microscope to control the bleeding. Even when the endoscope, I'm done about something about 250 endoscopies. But then okay. use it. Okay. Any other question, please uh, check the chat box. Mm -hmm. Shall we move on to the next talk now? Sir, I think yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. So it's my uh, great pleasure to invite uh, Professor Kajuhito Takuyuchi. He's a good friend uh, for the last seven years, uh, and uh, he is an, a clinical associate professor in the Department of uh, Neurosurgery at the Nagoya University, Aichi, Japan. He has been uh, a very uh, frequent uh, uh, participant in the international uh, meetings of uh, World Federation. And he's very actively participating in many courses and uh, workshops organized by IFNE as well as the Naples group. Uh, and uh, he, with his colleagues, has developed uh, uh, an intracerebral hematoma model that he uses for his uh, for the training purposes, training various fellows and uh, in workshops and all that, which is very interesting model and probably the only one which I know uh, of uh, uh, in the present scene of here. Uh, so here, Dr. Uh, uh, Kazuito, he is going to talk about various uh, kind of uh, uh, intracerebral tumor problems, particularly the pineal and para, uh, pineal and parapineal region in the form of a case presentation, an interesting case presentation. So, uh, Professor Kazuhito, please go ahead. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you for inviting me this great webinar. And uh, thank you for giving me a great opportunity to present our cases. Can you hear me? It's OK? Yes. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. good. OK. Uh, now, uh, Today is my topic is uh, case presentation uh, of the uh, pineal and parapineal regions. Endoscopy is a powerful surgical tool, especially for deep seated regions. We aggressively adapt endoscopy for pineal regions. Uh, today, I want to uh, I, I will present uh, three cases of pineal tumors that were removed endoscopically through different approaches. I use uh, three different approaches uh, for pineal regions. Endoscopic infratentrial approach and endoscopic occipital transtentrial approach and endoscopic transmodal approach, a stranger surgery. Uh, this is a first case, uh, four year old male. Uh, he was uh, appeared with uh, vomiting and headache M MRI uh, revealed the uh, uh, hydrocephalus and the uh, uh, pineal region here. Uh, the tumor was small and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, but the, uh, in 
Yeah. At first, we perform the uh, ETV and biopsy in this case. And uh, uh, pathological diagnosis with mixed germ cell tumor. So we perform the chemotherapy and radiotherapy for this patient. But uh, after the chemotherapy, the tumor which remains there, uh, very small remnant, but the uh, uh, tumor marker is still high. So uh, we decided to remove the uh, tumor. The tumor is small and located in the pioneer area. The keyhole surgery is enough for this patient. So I performed infratentary approach in this patient. Supracerebral infratentrial approach is well established surgical technique. Most neurosurgeons perform this surgery with sitting position. In the sitting position, the cerebellum moves to cauda side naturally by the gravity, and it makes easy to export the pineal region. Excuse me, Professor Kazuto, can you uh, make the full screen? It would be better if you can do that, please. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. How do I use it? Okay, go back to your presentation. Sir, sir, it is okay because he wants to read that English uh, okay. version. Fine, all right. Yeah. Sorry. Is it? Hmm? Oh, sorry. Is it okay? No, we can't. Is see. it okay? Oh, is it okay? Yeah, it is okay, yeah. sir. Oh, that's better. Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, but in Japan, the sitting position is hesitated because of the risk of em em embolism, AI embolism. Uh, but uh, uh, in the prone position, the uh, cerebellum go or, uh, descending. So or endoscopy can reduce the surgical space even in the uh, uh, prone position. Sorry. Uh, how about the uh, uh, median or paramedian approach? The cerebellum makes downward slope from medial to lateral like this, like a mountain. So uh, uh, if you go from the paramedian approach, the, uh, you can reduce the uh, uh, brain retraction. And uh, in the median, uh, Barmian veins are mainly located in the midline here. So uh, if you perform the uh, uh, surgery from the midline, you have to sacrifice these veins. But in the paramedian approach, uh, there is no uh, veins around this area. So I chose the paramedian infratentrial approach for this patient. Patient placed in the uh, prone position like this. We made a skin incision in the uh, paramedian area like this. Uh, two centimeter chronotomy was made like this. And uh, the brain was uh, slightly detracted. And this is a, a, a second arachnoid. We incised it and evacuate the uh, CSF. This is a tumor. Uh, there is a passing veins on the tumor like that. Uh, we preserve the, these passing veins as much as possible and then dissect the tumor from the tectum here. Opposite side was also dissected. And this rotating movement is very useful in the deep area. This movement is not required a, a, a shaft movement. So it's very smooth to uh, dissect. And this is a draining vein. Draining vein is also coagulated and cut. And the tumor was removed on block fashion like this. This is a wet field, 
confirm the complete hematosis like that. And uh, a gross total removal is achieved. The next case is 53-year-old uh, male. Uh, he appeared with uh, uh, diplopia and ataxia. MRI revealed a carbonoma. Uh, this carbonoma located in located behind the pons and about uh, below the uh, tectum here. So uh, we think the uh, occipital transtentorial approach is a good indication for this patient. Uh, in the conventional microscopic OTA, uh, the uh, relatively large skin flap and bone window is required. But uh, uh, in the uh, endoscopic OTA, the, uh, we can reduce the uh, skin incision size and the uh, craniotomy size. And the uh, end scope can, also, uh, can reduce the brain destruction and the brain spot. This is our surgery. Uh, we made a two centimeter craniotomy like that. This is a focus. And tent is here. And uh, straight sinus is running here. Uh, this is the second arachnoid. Maybe this is a precentral cerebral vein. Uh, we dissect the uh, tumor from the uh, surrounding vessels and brain. This, uh, uh, we use uh, uh, bipolar as well, like this like a very usual microscopic surgery. The most part of the uh, carbonoma was uh, dissected. This is a tectum. The main part of the carbonoma was removed. After that, uh, now I'm dissecting the tumor here. This part, very deeper side. And now I'm removing this part. In the deepest, deepest area, uh, this membrane is strongly adhered, and uh, there is no uh, uh, artery around this uh, membrane, so I remain it there. But uh, uh, very good removal is achieved like that. This is a sad case, uh, five year old male. Uh, he appeared with a headache and uh, vomiting. Uh, MRI revealed uh, hydrocephalus and the tumor uh, mainly located in the uh, south ventricle here. The uh, uh, tumor marker uh, indicates the uh, immature teratoma. This tumor is mainly located in the south ventricle, so we chose the uh, uh, transventricle, transmundo approach for this patient. In this technique, uh, I use a six millimeter diameter cylinder, this one. We made a bar hole, uh, two centimeter anterior from the coronal suture and two centimeter lateral from the center here. And insert a cylinder like that. But the uh, foramen mundo is here. So oh, I cut the uh, anterior septal vein uh, for expanding the foramen mundo and cut a massa intermediate uh, uh, for approaching boot. I insert the 2.7 millimeter end scope and very thin bipolar coagulator and suction tube, very coaxially like that. Uh, 
uh, of course, I use the uh, uh, nscope holder. This. We can perform the bimanual uh, technique in this uh, cylinder. This is a surgical video. We insert the cylinder to the lateral ventricle. Now uh, I cut the uh, muscle intermediate here in the middle. After that, uh, dissect the uh, anterior septal vein. And this is a thermostrate vein. We can only coagulate the uh, uh, anterior septal vein here. Cut mm -hmm. it. After that, insert a cylinder to the uh, third ventricle. And uh, this is a, a aqueduct. We dissect the tumor from the surrounding brain like this. All procedure was performed underwater to keep the uh, ventricular sides intact. And this is a draining vein, coagulate and cut. And there are some uh, uh, feeding arteries, of course, we coagulate it. This is the opposite side. But in this area, the uh, tumor was strongly adhered to the uh, ICV. So oh, we cut this here and remove the main part of the tumor. Like this. Two centimeter tumor was removed. And after that, uh, we remove the residual tumor adhere to the uh, ICV, like this. Then uh, complete removal was achieved. After the removal of the tumor, the damage to the phoronix is minimal, I think. Uh, complete removal was confirmed. And the uh, 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 surgical corridor is minimal, like this. This is how I choose the uh, surgical approaching route. The transmodal approach is very uh, quick and uh, very easy uh, for the uh, small size tumor. <coughs> the surgical corridor is uh, also small, so uh, the, I limit the, this surgery for the third ventricle tumor, cystic region, or, or less than two centimeter uh, tumor. In the OTA, uh, the uh, approaching time is a little bit uh, time consuming. This, uh, and, uh, uh, but the surgical space is very wide. This surgical technique is useful for the uh, tumor located below the uh, tectum, like this. Infratentary approach is uh, uh, quick, uh, quicker than the OTA, uh, and the surgical space is larger than the uh, This surgical approach is very good for the uh, uh, good for the tumor located above the uh, tectum, like this one. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kovito. Uh, it was a brilliant uh, presentation of uh, beautiful cases. Uh, any comment, uh, Professor Yadav? Let's begin with you. Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, regarding the Foreman Monroe, uh, the approach through the Foreman Monroe, uh, did you come across uh, any case with um, significant uh, or large hemorrhage and you have to convert? You said that you are using uh, uh, the liquid media as, as, a, as this thing. So any uh, case in which you have to convert from liquid uh, media uh, to the air media, if there was any bleed? Drive field. 
Yeah, one question and second was through the transtentorial approach, uh, were you using any retractor to retract the uh, medial portion of uh, the brain? Yeah. So, excellent, uh, I mean, excellent demonstration of technique. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. The uh, uh, first question is uh, hemorrhage. Uh, 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 I sometimes encounter, the, of course, uh, I sometimes encounter the severe hemorrhage during the surgery. But the, uh, the, if you pull the tumor, the hemorrhage point is uh, uh, far from the tip of the cylinder. But it, uh, I usually use a, a, a full, mm, mm, scissors for cutting the tumor. So uh, the hemorrhagic point is always uh, in front of the uh, endoscope tip. So th this is very important. Don't pull the tumor. Uh, uh, and don't move, deep, uh, move the endoscope uh, when you encounter the uh, hemorrhage. Hemorrhage hemorrhagic point is always in front of you. So uh, we can, uh, if I encounter the hemorrhage, we evacuate the liquid and uh, uh, use a bipolar coagulator or uh, uh, put the SARS cell there and just wait. No problem. Uh, I experienced about uh, 130 endoscopic uh, cylinder surgery but uh, uh, I don't switch to the microscope. Is it okay? <laughs> and uh, uh, about the trans temporal trans uh, uh, In the trans temporal approach, uh, I use the uh, usual spatula at the beginning. But uh, after the evacuators of the CSF, there's no need to put the uh, uh, spatula. Uh, brain uh, shrinked. So, no problem. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, excellent uh, presentation and a very beautiful depiction. Thank you very much. Uh, regarding the coagulation of the septal vein to gain better entry, did you really get any advantage or this was just to see that you don't encounter any bleeding from the brain? I mean, why did you have to coagulate it? Uh, because uh, I have to cut the uh, anterior septal vein. But before, uh, I, I want to keep the uh, water field, wet field. If the uh, uh, hemorrhage occurs, the uh, uh, visualization becomes very bad. So uh, I want to, uh, uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> Uh, avoid, uh, I want to avoid the uh, uh, small, even small hemorrhage. And there was no deficit in the patient by doing, by coagulating the septal vein. You did not have any neurological no. deficit. No deficit. Yeah. Of course, you, if you cut the uh, 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 thermostrate vein, the patient. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To enlarge the to enlarge the corridor of uh, Furman Monroe, if you don't uh, cut the septal vein, and so that uh, gives you a little more space. Uh, if the Furman Monroe is very large, then possibly otherwise you to reach the posterior third ventricle, you have to enlarge this posteriorly, yeah. and uh, to do and, that, you need to have and plus massa intermedia also at times, mm. which he showed. Yeah, Professor Komatsu, your comment, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Takeuchi. Uh, I think the, you presented the two pediatric cases. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, in pediatric cases, uh, sometimes the tentoria, uh, tentorial sinus is well developed. So hospital transtentorial approach may be difficult. Do you have any? opinion about that uh, it's possible mm. or not in the yeah 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 i think it's very difficult 
But uh, uh, I cooperate. Uh, <laughs> I will cooperate the tentary sinus. So uh, I can. I think I can cut the uh, tent. Mm -hmm. But in the, I I have no uh, case of the pediatric patient with. Uh, 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 sorry, I don't have the uh, pediatric uh, occipital transtetral case. I usually use uh, infratentral approach or uh, transmodal approach for the pediatric patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, uh, I, I I don't have a clear answer for you. Okay, okay. thank you, thank you. <laughs> Sarat, are you around, Sarat? I think he's done. Well, Dr. Bhagat Singh. Yeah. yeah. Hi. It's a very nice presentation and uh, he's always a very aggressive endoscopic surgeon. Every meeting I admire him. I, I have one question. In pediatric patient uh, with hydrocephalus in the pineal region tumor, when the endoscopic approach after that, you have uh, the brain uh, shunken and there is a fall of the brain usually after we remove the tumor. So in post-operative scan, you, although you showed it is very nicely there is no fall of uh, no air, even uh, no subdural collection. If you come across after the decompression of the tumor in hydrocephalus, in pediatric patient, you have a, a subdural collection or subdural, uh, the fallen sunken brain. Of course, of course, I sometimes experience that. <laughs> but uh, in the tumor removal surgery, I feel, 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 uh, uh, I feel the water uh during the surgery so uh, i think the uh, problem is uh, very uh, rare welcome welcome to india <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, there is one question from uh, dr rakesh gupta from uh, indore I think it's for uh, everybody. Uh, he says, in last two cases, I have used ET tube, endotracheal tube, which is in between uh, Dr. Yadav's retractors and syringe tubular retractors. As far as uh, rigidity is concerned, end of the tube rests on the cortical edge. Professor Yadav, any comment on uh, using the ET tube? I think, I think um, different... Uh, tubular retractors of different things can be used. There is absolutely no problem. Uh, what I feel uh, for, <laughs> for my, uh, I like that because maybe because of the inherent uh, loving of this, that uh, the tube can be, uh, can be <laughs> cut and it can be, it can be um, folded. And plus uh, uh, for surgeon, who do not have too much of facilities uh, because we have to use at least two instrument for any bleeding or anything. So therefore the size can also be enlarged, but those things are difficult when you work in the third ventricle. But in third ventricle tumor also, I, I go supracoroidal, uh, transect the, uh, the septal vein and then things can be done. So ET tube, yes, uh, can be used. Any tubular things can be used. Uh, yes. yes, good. Tubular retractor is being used for 30 years. So yes. and the host of them. So if you read the literature, you know, it is flooded with uh, various, everybody has his own. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As long as, you know, it is tube and it is comfortable. Are you comfortable yeah. with this? I think yes. it's all right, all right. Any other question? for any speaker. Excellent uh, webinar. Yeah. yeah. Excellent, excellent. Everything went so well. Right, one, one comment I just want to make. Uh, uh, Pro Professor Takeuchi and Professor Komatsu, you uh, must have seen uh, Professor Yadav using that uh, flexible tube for intracerebral hematomas and various intracerebral parenchymal tumors and all that. What is your comment on that? Because you are using, you know, ready-made uh, uh, high-profile ports for uh, this purpose. He's using the simple tube.
which can be folded on its own mm -hmm. very soft in consistency it yeah, can be yeah. folded and uh, utilized that, that that flexible tube is a handmade tube or not mm -hmm. or the it's available in the market yes it is available the cost is uh, less than uh, 5 rupees indian rupees <laughs> really, really. Yeah. We don't have such a flexible retractor tube in Japan, so I'd like to try it. Probably, I think the, there are a lot of benefits in the flexible tube. Yeah, it is silicone tube. Uh, oh. You can fold it, and the cost is hardly anything. Does not produce any harm. You can use. Uh, your uh, tube obviously is excellent and the size of incision is small uh, but for me i think uh, the the brain can expand once you put in a tube there uh, there is no destruction of brain parenchyma mm -hmm. and one can use simple uh, two instruments along with the endoscope so mm. to use two instrument along with the endoscope, you need a tube size of uh, around one centimeter. We use uh, endoscope of four centimeter. Then you need to have two instrument, one suction and one bipolar coagulation. So that's why I was asking uh, the, whether this uh, suction and coagulation is available in the market, Indian market, and how much is the cost? Uh, that That's actually, uh, I mean, it can reduce the size of opening. We can use a smaller tube. And the smaller tubes are also available. It is a silicone tube. You cut it and put it inside and use your endoscope. Very uh, inexpensive. You have a, a design of your tube. You can probably fabricate one here. And uh, <laughs> I think now uh, the Kalielkar have agreed, nobody agreed to, uh, to manufacture this because the cost was very less. So um, now Kalielkar Surgical of Mumbai has agreed to give it uh, one meter, two meter or like that. So buy one meter uh, that cost, uh, I think 100 rupees and then you can make 100 uh, tube out uh, of that. Okay, Adam. Yep. Uh, what I was saying that, you know, the Sergivir company is seriously considering making the uh, a little uh, soft port, which can be used for evacuation of intracerebral hematoma. And they have not come out with their proposal, or, but I think some serious consideration is being. I don't know what is, what is the problem. I talked to all their bosses uh, to kindly uh, do this. So unfortunately, most of them were saying to increase the cost of uh, product. I said I cannot do that. Absolutely. So because because it's a tube, the tube is tube. So you cannot make it more complex. Dr. Fuminari, can I ask you one question? Dr. Fuminari, yeah, uh, yeah sure. You uh, have been working in Kolkata. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you are now removing hematomas after 48 hours or something like that because the patients present late mm -hmm. there, am I right? Mm -hmm. Yes, right. So in contrast to Japan and India, so far as the delayed presentation, mm -hmm. do you see any difference in the outcome because of delayed presentation or it is all- uh, Yeah, yeah, yes. The... Yeah, 72 hours. After the 72 hours, I think the endoscopic surgery is in, sometimes not effective. Right. In that case, we have to be uh, cautious about the surgical indication. The right. Only hematoma evacuation is not effective. Sometimes the, the compressive, the cranitum is required. Mm -hmm. Mm. And yeah. also the, in Japan, the many patients are elderly patients. But in India, the most many patients are younger than younger, right. or, uh, something like that. So the also the I think the mm, the surgical indication in India must be restricted, the limited, limited uh, rather than Japan. I feel, I feel that. You mean to say they should be evacuated? Uh, number one, they should be evacuated earlier. Or you yeah. 
Indi indication is not there. What what is your opinion? Uh, uh, what, what do you mean? I'm I'm sorry. The... First of all, do you think they should be evacuated earlier? Uh huh. Opinion. Hmm. Do you think there's an indication in most of the cases or no indication in many of the cases because they're younger? You said they're younger. So what? No, do you... no, no. The, uh, but but uh, I think the the for example the uh, my strategy was that the uh, first uh, endoscopically evacuate the hematoma. If the it was not uh, effective enough, the, we can judge during the surgery. In that case, uh, the decompression craniotomy okay, okay. was added. So whether to add decompression craniotomy or not to add decompression craniotomy mm. is the question. Yes, you my mean? comments. My comments on this early surgery versus delayed surgery. Early surgery, if you do in endoscope with the help of endoscope, it is easier because uh, the hematoma evacuation soft. Uh, it has soft. not become uh, fibrous. Yes. So yes. the late it becomes, it becomes difficult, yeah. or maybe it becomes difficult with the kind of tube which you are using. Uh, the kind of tube which we use, the larger one uh, with two instrument, it is easy because at times when there is a patient comes late and there is a deterioration. There are patients who are in good GCS before with a large hematoma, they expand and they come to us late. We operate them and we don't find any problem without adding uh, hemicrinectomy or anything, decompression. So endoscope, even delayed surgery is possible and it is safe. But the clot becomes hard and firm by the time. Yeah. yeah. Technically, That's better is main problem. Technically, it becomes difficult to yes. remove the entire clot. Yes. Right. That is the main problem. Okay. That's okay. great. All right. Then if there is uh, no other question or comment, then uh, shall we conclude uh, this meeting? Yes. All right. Yes. I would again uh, like to thank our guest speakers, uh, Professor uh, Komatsu and Professor Takeuchi, Professor uh, Yadav, Professor Pathak, Professor Bhagat Singh, and everybody else who participated in this. Professor Sarat Chandra. Sarat Chandra also, I think he has left. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll meet next month with uh, some other topic. Yeah, we, we have just, if, if allow me, the next webinar uh, series four uh, is on 22nd of November, which is again a Sunday between four to 6 p.m. And the topics we are going to discuss are going to be anterior third ventricular tumors, tricks of the trade. And the second topic is uh, endoscopic treatment of lateral ventricular tumors. So 22nd November, Sunday, again, we meet. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deepak Naik for yeah. your, uh, all help to organize this webinar. Our pleasure, our pleasure. And please say a few words if you want. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, audience, uh, for joining us today for this third episode of uh, the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sankla, sir, for conceptualizing this and uh, coordinating this with our speakers to conduct this webinar. Uh, on behalf of Health and You, I would like to thank uh, Komasu-san and uh, Takeuchi-san. Uh, thank you very much. Arigatou uh, gozaimashita. It was great to have you here in India from Japan. Uh, and uh, our panelists, Professor Sarat Chandra and Dr. Bhagat Singh for their value addition and our evergreen speaker, uh, Dr. Yadav sir, with uh, your uh, value addition suggestions, your opinions and your fantastic innovation of such a simple silicon tube retractor. Now it has demand in Japan. So we would love to export that uh, to <laughs> Japan with our connections in Japan, uh, your innovation can go to Japan. It is normally the reverse. Japanese innovation comes to India. It will be our privilege to get Indian innovation to Japan. And uh, Professor Komatsu-san is really interested in it. Uh, 5,000 5, yen. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Yadav will not allow us to do that. Uh, so, and uh, thank you, uh, Sankla sir, for coordinating, conceptualizing this fantastic webinar. I would like to... Uh, announce here that 212 uh, neurosurgeons attended this webinar for from four different countries and we have 13 logins from abroad. So audience, thank you very much for uh, tuning in for this uh, webinar. Uh, we really appreciate giving your time to us. 
and uh, this is deepak naik on behalf of health and you signing off uh, please continue your support to health and you products uh, we bring in innovation like all these uh, speakers and uh, panelists bring in innovation in their neurosurgery uh, we enjoyed carrying this webinar to you thank you very much and oyasumi nasai uh, kumasu san and uh, takeuchi san thank you very much and uh, wishing you bye and good night thank you mr naik thank you so much